Hello, welcome or welcome back to Dog 101. This is your host Nick. Uh, joining me as always is Lilu the Loud on cue. Uh, in the background you're going to be hearing my dog just for a little ambiance. So today's episode is Collars and Leashes. And how long do I talk about it for? Oh, I don't know because I'm recording it right now. But I can guarantee you that that's probably going to be a lot longer than you thought I could talk about Collars and Leashes. What is it? It's just a leash. It's just a collar. It's a little bit more than that. And I'll explain why. So we should probably start with the leashes. It's just a leash. Any old leash is a leash, right? Yes, and also no. So if you're just getting a brand new puppy, I highly recommend that you get a collar and a leash that is on clearance. Because that puppy is going to quickly outgrow the collar. It is going to chew on the leash because this is not a natural state for a dog to be in. So I definitely recommend getting the cheap ones to start out with before they get used to the concept because... This is something that's going to be very difficult. For instance, with puppies, you're always going to deal with the new leash syndrome, which I like to call when they just plant their feet and just you're pulling them and then they just don't want you to have you pull them. It just feels unnatural for them. So it's, it's something that both you and the dog are going to have to get adjusted to. So if it's a very, very short puppy that is all the way down to the floor, you might want to start off with a six footer. That way, they have a little bit of leeway so that they're not always constantly being threatened of getting kicked by your feet, but you also don't have to stoop down. And it's something that typically if you're going to be having a medium to regular sized dog, then four feet or less is recommended because then you can keep them close to you and not have them get too far ahead of you where they don't see where you are so that you guys can walk as a group. Now, I highly recommend static leashes, I guess is what we can call them. So, um, the leashes that don't change size, the non-retractable leashes, are the ones that I highly recommend, especially at the beginning, because a leash that is always the same size is the least confusing for a dog, because they always know how far away they can get before it starts to pull. And that is the problem with retractable leashes. Now, I'm not going to poop on retractable leashes. They do have their place, but it's not recommended, especially in the beginning, because it is going to encourage pulling. Not discourage, but encourage pulling. And because of that, she's being really loud today. The main reason why is because I took her collar off in order to give you a visual example, and she is loving the fact that she's naked right now running around the house. If you want to see what she looks like, I think in an earlier episode, I pick her up on my lap so you can see what Lilu looks like in case you're like, who is this Who is this Lilu the loud that we keep hearing about? I'd love to see a picture or something. I do, I do show her in a previous episode. But anyway, so... I recommend getting a leash that's constantly the same size, and then that way they know how far away that you're getting at each time. Now, there's a couple variations of those. One of them is a slip lead. And it's weird because I've been hearing a lot of trainers now requiring that that is the leash that they take to the class. I'm not sure what the reasoning is for that. Slip leads have their place, I guess, because if you are going to have a dog that is relatively good on the leash and you're just going to be slipping it on and off of them, it's pretty easy and quick and doesn't require fiddling around with the connection piece that most leashes have. But I usually recommend just getting a plain old, stinking old, you know, regular old six foot or four foot leash and uh, using that for your mainstay. Now for the retractables, uh, like I was saying, the reason why that encourages pulling is because they never know what length it's going to be. So sometimes it's real close to you if there's a car going by, sometimes you could let them go out like, you know, 12 feet from you and everything in between. So all they're going to do their entire lives is test, okay, is it 12 feet yet? Is it 15 feet yet? Is it, you know, oh, it's only four feet. Well, maybe it'll be six feet in another second. So it actually encourages them to test and pull and test. And that's why a retractable leash, I usually only recommend if you have them on a regular size leash until you get to say a field. And now on the field, they're allowed to be on the retractable. Um, retractables do have their own issues. You know, it's it's mechanisms and stuff that can always go wrong, and so it's it doesn't really have a backup if it's going to just suddenly fail, if it's going to snap, if it's going to uh, have the rewind mechanism break and just basically completely come up apart from the contraption. So if you're going to get one, I recommend it being once you're more of an intermediate rather than a novice when it comes to the leash. And there's also other types of leashes out there, like for instance, there's like the 15 foot, 30 foot ones. If you want to do some training where you're doing recall, like, you know, come exercises, and you want them to be able to get a good fair distance away from you, but then also still come back, but still have control over them, then there's those leashes as well. So you have a variety of choices in front of you, but I definitely recommend if it's your first time with a dog, then you get the cheap and easy ones for right now, and then you graduate to the more robust, uh, expensive ones later on. 
And definitely, if you don't want a dog that pulls, I highly recommend sticking to the uh, you know ones that stay the same length. Now, when it comes to collars, I'm briefly, briefly going to touch upon harnesses. So you might think that your dog is too teeny that has too small of a neck and you don't want to put the pressure on the neck. Um, or it's a dog that's always constantly, eh, eh, eh. so you feel like a harness is the better way to go. And there's a lot to be said for harnesses. However, the thing is to think about, most of them attach to the back, which means that it spreads all the way across the chest, which means it's going to, again, encourage pulling. Because now, much like a sled dog, you spread all the way across the chest so they can really get in there. They can really just pull and all of the weight is going on their chest. And so they can actually get, you know, dig in their heels a little bit and actually really start pulling. So a vest, a, a, a harness is not necessarily going to discourage pulling. Now they do have some vests, uh, I don't know why I keep calling it vests, but I'm leaving it in. The harnesses um, that attach to the front can, and I say can, maybe with a little, you know, asterisk or quotation marks, they can help discourage pulling because the idea behind it is that if they start pulling, it kind of turns them to the side and they can't put their full body weight on the leash, so they have to kind of re-square up, and so... Most dogs actually, it'll work for them or it won't. They'll sometimes figure out later on that it's like, oh, well, if it's pulling up to this side, and then if I just square my shoulders that way and then keep on pulling, then I can get, you know, back up to 100% pulling. So harnesses are mostly to try and take the weight off of the neck if they have any neck issues, but it's mostly a comfort and sometimes a safety feature. A lot of these harnesses have reflective coating on them, so they, they're more visible at night if the headlights in the car hit them. But I like sticking to just straight-up collars. I like doing coats and or uh, reflective harnesses for, you know, night walking just solely as a safety feature, not necessarily as a no pull feature. Um, and again, I, I'm, I'm briefly skipping over the harnesses, but they have the front pull and they also have the ones where it actually kind of goes up under the armpits, which can feel a little uncomfortable for some dogs and discourage pulling to a point. This is not a miracle cure. So if you do have a no pull harness, it's not going to be a miracle cure. And... I, I like sticking for collars and then just some good old-fashioned no-pull training in order to deal with a dog pulling as opposed to trying to get the contraption. So with no further ado, let's get into collars. So the two most common ones that you're going to see are the ones that look like a belt buckle. So they'll have the, the pre-drilled holes and you can put it to a certain fitness. And I've never really had any luck with those. It always seems like no matter where you have the dog's neck size, it's always going to be one hole. One hole here, it's going to be too tight. One, you know, the next hole down, it's going to be a little too loose. Ideally, what you're looking for is to be able to get two fingers comfortably between the neck and the collar, so that you're not choking them when they say lay down. Because when they lay down, their you know neck kind of just stretches out a little bit, and so they'd be choking themselves a little bit every time they tried to relax. So having a collar that doesn't adjust with the dog. I'm not a huge fan of, but those, those are the most common ones you're going to run across. So you have the ones that look like a belt buckle, and then there's also the ones that you have that they'll clip to each other, and that you can like you know slowly adjust, you know, and it takes a little bit. And those ones are good too. But again, if you have a dog that you need to get two fingers in, and they're going to either be like you know a small dog, so two fingers is more than enough for them to pop it off, or even a bigger dog that has more of a thicker neck than a smaller head then they're going to be able to also pull it off. You know, you know the move that, a, that I'm talking about with the dog, right? So when a dog does that thing where they plant, and you try and pull them, and then they pull, and then the collar pops off, and now they're free, and they're running around, and that's the last thing you want to have with a dog, um, especially if you haven't been practicing your recall training. So that's why I, my mainstay has always been the Martingdale collar. So it's a very simple concept. It's very basic. But basically what this is, is it just looks like a regular everyday collar that the dog would put their head through with this little bit at the bottom that is the difference. So what this does is it, if the dog has it on and they try and pull, then the circumference of what's around their neck gets smaller. So this is not supposed to choke them. It is not supposed to correct them or keep them from pulling because a dog when they have their neck compressed, does not stop them from pulling. You've probably discovered this yourself, which is why, I'll be honest, the chain collars, the choke collars, they call them, you probably know them as choke collars, they do F all when it comes to keeping the dog from pulling. All you're doing is damaging their trachea, and they're still going to pull just as hard, only now they're going to do it while wheezing. 
don't want to have that happen. So this is not supposed to do any kind of choking. Literally what it's just supposed to do is once it's over their head and they try and pull, then that gets smaller and now they can't pull it over the bone that's behind the ears and it won't ever come off if they're trying to pull. Now if they're not pulling and it's nice and loose, then it's, it's one of the loosest collars on them that's also still the safest from getting off of their head. So basically what you do is you tighten it up and you make the circumference small enough so that it can just barely fit over their head, like just barely over their ears. And then that's gonna leave like three or four finger lengths underneath. Pardon me, that's so unprofessional. That will happen. Don't you just love it when they tell you that it's potential spam so that, that way you can report them later so that they stop telling you that you have a court date that you don't have? Uh, I apologize for that, but again, this is the theme of the show. I'm keeping it in. I'm not a good editor. I'm going to just plug, uh, plow, plow along. But so you get it just big enough to be able to fit over their head. And then, you know, obviously this is the part that it attaches to. And again, the shrinking of the circumference is literally just supposed to keep them from pulling it off of their head. The whole rest of the time, they have so much looseness around here. If they lay down to sleep and their neck just, you know, spills out, it's not going to choke them at all. It's definitely the first and last collar that I'll ever use on a dog when it comes to that. Now, there's a couple more types of collars, and one of them I did touch upon, which is the chain, choke, slipknot, link collar that I don't feel should even be on the market. I, I don't feel there's a place for them. I don't think that they are anything but just vicious, you know, cruel things. And what's funny is that you might have seen a prong collar and thought the same thing about that. Now, what's ironic is that a prong collar, I would actually recommend over a chain collar. Now, hold on and let me finish before you get, uh, mm-hmm, yep, that's probably a message saying you are due for a court date or some crap that isn't true and that's just them scamming you. So here's a little Easter egg uh, tip for you that if it's an automated voice message system that is saying something scary like the IRS is out to get you or that you have a you know court date that they want to help you with, it's it's all BS. Uh, report them if you have that feature on your phone. Let's try and get them to stop doing that and interrupting podcasts. Anyway, the prong collar. It looks like a medieval torture device. It is that metal collar that has like these vicious prongs all throughout it and it looks like it is the worst thing you could ever put on a dog and it is infinitely better than a choke collar it seems weird but let me explain so basically what those are for is they are a training collar and infused incorrectly they are yes very much cruel you're not going to put a prong collar on and then tie a dog out to a stake and call it good that is not what they are supposed to be used for they're supposed to be used for people that know what they're doing with them, and they are actually great at doing corrective training. Now, corrective training is not something that I am very skilled in because I am more of the uh, positive uh, dog training. And that means that you en encourage positive behavior with rewards, and it seems like bribing, but it's not. But in this case, it is corrective behavior, and it may or may not be necessary depending on your school of thought and the dog's past and what you're actually trying to get done. But the idea behind it is that those prongs are supposed to simulate a mother's mouth. Now, if you want to get a little bit into the uh, background of dogs, so let's say you're a puppy, you're born, you're blind, and you have no idea what's going on. All you know is that you crave a teat to suckle on. And so you start, you know, find, finding, you know, the nipple, you know, feed off of it. And little do you realize you're growing teeth at the same time. And those teeth are sharp. They're tiny, pointy, and sharp. Anybody that's owned a puppy and has gotten bit, it's just like, okay, well, you know, that, that hurt. That broke a little bit of skin. And older dogs' teeth rarely break the skin unless they really are, you know, biting at you. Uh, they, they're, the do adult dog teeth are a little bit more dull by comparison. But I digress. So your puppy, you're suckling, and then you suckle a little too hard. Those razor-sharp teeth almost bit off a nipple. And so what the mom would do is she would, she would quickly just do a quick little nip. It, it, it's less painful and more surprising, if anything. But she would do a nip, so the dog's suckling too hard, and all of a sudden, ooh, what the heck was that? Okay. Well, okay, I don't know what that was, but I'm going to go back to suckling. Uh, all right, I'm suckling, and it, that's fine. So I'm going to suckle and suckle some more, and then get excited and suckle too hard, bite the teeth in, and then get the nipped again. And then it usually, that's the second time, and then it's that's all that it takes. Is the dog's like, oh, I get it. Suckle too hard. I get nipped, suckle just gently enough to get the milk, but not hurt mom, and I won't get nipped. 
So a corrective nip is something that a dog grew up on, and that's what that collar is supposed to simulate. So when you use it, you're ideally supposed to just do a loose, tight, loose, loose, tight, loose. You just very quickly pop them, is what it's called. You pop the collar when they are doing something that uh, you didn't want them to do, and they learn it relatively quickly. Now, again, this isn't something that I would purchase or use on a dog because I don't use that school of training. I do the positive dog training. But in this case, it, it, it is an effective method, and it is something that is, again, far more humane than a choke collar, but it's supposed to be used correctly. Now, if it's a dog that, just like a choke collar, is at the end of its leash, <laughs> And the, and the progs are digging into the skin. I mean, that's not the correct way to use it. Or if you're just jerking them around all over the place, then that's also not the correct way to use it. It's supposed to be used by at least an intermediate, not a novice, in trying to do corrective training. So I don't have a place for it in my household, but I definitely don't think that it shouldn't exist. I, I think that the choke collars shouldn't even be on the market anymore. That's just my personal opinion, and now I don't, I'm not employed by a pet store anymore, so I don't have to worry about censoring myself, about saying that, get them out of there. Like, the pet store that I just worked at that I recently left was getting rid of all the static collars, the shock collars. And they were, like, saying, you know, you shouldn't have to shock a dog in order to, in order to train them. And you know what? I feel like those have their place a little bit more than even the choke collars do. And the choke collars are still in the store, and those freaking things, static collars, are nowhere to be found. And, you know... I, I, I might have touched upon this in a previous episode, but when it comes to the static collars, there's so many steps that you should have gotten to before you even got to that point. You know, you, you should have had training. You should have had, um, you know, positive encouragement. Um, and, and even before you get to a static collar, there's vibration collars. There's sonic collars that make a noise that only dogs can hear. And there's um, citronella spray can uh, collars where if, you know, for instance, they bark, it does a little puff of citronella, and so they're like, oh, oh, God, citrus, oh, 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 oh. And, you know, those are actually deemed to be the most effective collar. Like, even, I think it's 75% success rate. Now, what's funny is that I don't know that that's an actual statistic that's that you can trust, because with the static collars, they actually need a point of contact on their, on their um, skin in order for the static shock to get to their skin, and most dogs, especially the most barky ones, like huskies that are very vocal, you stick it on them, and their th their fur is so thick, it's not touching their skin for days. So you return it saying, this thing's a piece of crap. Well, it's not. You you would actually have to shave down a dog's neck and most breeds in order for it to even touch. So maybe people are, you know, the statistics might be wrong is what I'm saying. For instance, with Lilu the Loud, that you've heard quite a bit in this episode, she's actually, you know, uh, making quite a noise this episode. Lilu the Loud, is one of those weird dogs where she was a stray, and then a shelter, shelter, and then us. So you could literally throw anything at her that is food, and she will eat it, especially if it's something that she's seen mom or dad eat. So she loves oranges. Citronella spray would just be like, she would wear out the friggin' battery and the citronella spray in a half hour because she would just be like, dude, the world has flavoring now anytime I bark. It would actually encourage her to bark. She's a weirdo. But anyway, like I said, you know, in previous episodes, you know, results may vary. So I don't think that static collars don't have a place in this world, especially when it comes to fencing. If you have a wireless or wired fence, you know, the ones that you either run a wire around the property or you use the uh, transmitter so that they have this circle about the property and the dog has a collar on it that gives a warning and then a vibration and then a shock if they get to the perimeter of the fence. I mean, those are still being sold by the pet stores. So I feel like they have a place. I don't feel like choke collars have a place. I feel like prong collars may have a place. It's debatable. It's something that I'm open-minded to. The static collars, I think, absolutely have a place. Like, let's say that you've tried everything else on the market, but you have a dog that has separation anxiety that you're working on, but in the meantime, they bark their full head off the whole time you're gone, and the neighbors are calling the cops, and you're going to have to either get rid of the dog or find a solution that requires that you can still keep them. Well, the static collars are not that inhumane. Like, for instance, most of them actually have an auto-sensing feature. So what it is is that it starts off at level 1, where you can't even tell that it made a static discharge. And then you bark again, level 2, now you might have felt a little tremor. Now bark level 3, okay, now you might have felt a pinch. Now bark level 4, okay, now you definitely felt static. Okay, bark level 5, whoo, what was that? Now, it realizes that you didn't bark after level five and it locks in level five so it's the minimum amount of correction required for the dog to not bark for you to not have to give the dog up for adoption 
I hands down would say, do the static collar over getting rid of the dog. You know, that's just me. So that might be controversial. Tell me what you feel in the comments. But my point is that when it comes to that, I feel like there is room for debate when it comes to the electronic stuff. Now, this is where I might lose some of you because I have, much like always been a huge advocate for, I feel like um, bully breeds get a bad rap, bad, you know, bad rep, bad rap, whatever it is, that the um, head halter is one of the most misunderstood collars on the planet. So all it is, is just this. This is just a very simple, it's like a leash with one extra step. And this has been the most hated thing, but unfortunately the most useful thing when it comes to not pulling. So I feel like I need to get into this because this is something that I have struggled with people for the longest time. So you have a dog that pulls and then you've, you know, Refuse the dog training class. Okay, well then let's look at hardware for your dog. So you tried a, a, a harness. That didn't work. You returned it. You've tried this. You've tried that. None of them work. And so you finally are briefly considering, okay, well maybe let's look into this whole head halter thing. And then you don't get any instruction from the person selling it to you. You bring it home. The dog hates it. And then you bring it back and you say, yeah, I want my money back. The dog absolutely hates it. Well, the dog is not going to enjoy it. First of all, like, let's just put it right out there. They're going to like it a lot more than having a prong, uh, choke collar on or a prong collar on or a, a static collar on. So I don't know why the sales for those are so much better than a head halter. But I do. I do also know the reasons why some of the sales are better than a head halter. So first of all, to an untrained eye, if a dog has a piece of fabric over their nose, regardless of how small it is. I mean, this is such a small piece of fabric over the nose. But they see... Meet my my dummy dog. I'm going to use props for this one just because, sorry for the people that are just listening. I This is something that requires a visual. So I've been torn about trying to use props and stuff because I know that nine, uh, 75, 90%, all my statistics are made up on this podcast. But um, basically, the majority of people listening are just listening, not watching. So in this case, you're going to have to find the video version of this, even though it's going to infuriate you because as I'm telling you this, I'm watching the background and it's flickering and it's maddening. This is a low-budget podcast. I do apologize. I will, you know, hopefully get a better, uh, com you know, camera in the future. But all I'm saying is that if a dog has this over its nose, people think it's a muzzle. Now, look at this. Look at this adorable friggin' stuffed animal. Does that look like a muzzle to you? Look, if that was an actual mouth, it would have the ability to still rah, 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 rah. It would still be able to do all of the biting and, you know, barking and chewing that it would want to with that over the nose. It's not a muzzle. And, and I don't have an untrained eye anymore. Like once you see it, you can't unsee it. There's no way that this would deter any sort of biting. It's not a muzzle. But yet I still see so many people that go up to a dog and especially if it's a dog with black fur and a black one of these, they don't notice until it's almost too late. And then they're like, oh my God, he has a muzzle. Ah, let's get out of here. So this is not a muzzle. This is what it is. What it is, it is a genius invention that basically works on a dog's desire to, if you're walking a dog and they're in front of you, they want to be in front of you and then doing the sniff, the sniff, the sniff, sniff, the sniff, the sniff, the sniff, the sniff. For the most part, when a dog's on a walk, they want to turn their brain off and their nose on. I discovered this in one of, uh, one of the first dogs that I ever considered my own. And she was a dummy on the leash. Like we're talking, she would walk off the curb, straight into traffic and just not even realize until I yanked her out of harm's way. And then one she was an escape artist. So one time she got off the leash and so she was run up to the road and I'm chasing her and I'm like, well, I stopped because I was like, well, do I keep chasing her into the traffic or I still have to catch her. So I still have to get her eventually. So as I'm standing there pondering, she gets up to the side of the road and then she, like they teach you in school, looks left, right, left again, and then crosses. And I'm like, you bitch, which I can say because she technically is a female dog. You bitch, you knew all along. You'd look left, right, left again before you crossed the road. You knew about roads. You knew about the danger. Well, when they're on the end of the leash, they like, the humans got it. Now I just want to... The whole walk. They want to use their nose, and that's their favorite thing to do. They are like 90% olfactory. Again, all statistics are made up on Nick 101 disclaimers. So it's really just focusing on the, on the idea that 
if a dog is out in front and sniffing and pulling and they start to pull, the way that this is set up is it brings their head down into the side if they pull too hard. It doesn't choke them. That's my favorite part about it. It has nothing to do with their neck. This is all their all their face, which, you know, has, you know, that's a sturdy bone. It's fine. So it pulls it down to the side if they pull too hard. So they have to ease up in order to get their nose out again to be able to sniff. And they pull too hard again, and now it's bound to the side. And then they back up, and then they're able to sniff again. It's genius. This is, this is like, you know, I wish I invented it and just was able to sit on a pile of money, but I wouldn't. It wouldn't have been a million-dollar idea because, uh, unfortunately, the misinformed don't realize what a great product they have in their hands. So they buy it, they throw it into their dog, and what's the first thing the dog's going to do? The dog is going to try and get it off of their face because it doesn't feel natural. A dog shouldn't have something over their nose. Like, do you realize how long it took to get adjusted to these glasses? Like, having that on my nose and getting dents in the nose and, like, just getting pimples under the nose? Like, it doesn't feel natural. It doesn't feel natural to them either. Poor thing, all right? So, yeah, they're going to hate it. So if you are going to get it, there is a brand that actually has a training DVD. I believe they've switched over to just having a QR code on the uh, uh, outside of the box. But the point is, there's a training video. So I'm going to skip all that middleman, and I'm just going to tell you right away. So you buy it, you bring it home, and you throw the box on the ground. And then they're like, what is this box on the ground? Anything on the ground is my domain, right? So they just start sniffing the box, and you just start flinging treats at them. And you take it out of the box, and then they sniff the thing, and you start flinging treats at them. And then my favorite way to do it is so if I did, if I had both hands, just imagine that I have a treat behind. So I would hold the treat behind and then hold that there, and then they would go sniff, 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 sniff to get the treat. Now they've just put the thing on themselves. Now if you can attach it, they just basically did that themselves. So like it's really hard for them to to argue with you. And then once it's on, you attach the leash and you just immediately start moving. Anytime that you stop, they're gonna stop, and then they're gonna try and and get the leash off of them. So you just keep moving. And, you, and, and ideally, you keep treating them. And then so you eventually get to the point where they understand, oh, okay, well, if this is going to be on, that means that it's treat walk. This is on treat walk. This is on treat walk. So it's similar to the idea that if you have a dog that you're training for a, um, a service animal, so a dog that is going to be, you know, a, a, a helping service animal, well, it's amazing to watch. But if you have that dog and you put the service vest on, they go into work mode. They know what that vest means. They've been trained in the vest, so they know that when the vest is on, it's all business. And as soon as the vest is off, now I'm allowed to say hi to people. So, by the way, if you see a dog with a service vest on, nine times out of ten, I know you want to, but don't approach them, don't don't make eye contact, don't pet them. As much as you want to, if you're a dog lover like me, it hurts. It hurts to not do it, but most dogs, if they have the vest on... As long as it's not a vest that somebody just purchased online and are using in order to get their dog into the store and they're not trained, F those people. I'm going to say it. F those people. But you, you, you are scum of the earth. You make it hard for people that actually need a service dog to be accepted because I had known somebody that had a pit bull for a service dog and she was flat out refused in many businesses to be able to be allowed in. And it was a genuine medical dog and... Just because it was a pit bull, they were like, no, 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 you bought a vest online, now you're trying to get my your vicious attack animal in. This is the sweetest dog I've ever met in my entire life, you know? And so, I'm sorry to get on a soapbox real quick during the middle of the collars and leashes, but it's something I feel that strongly about, is that people that claim that their dog is a service dog and they're not are the scum of the earth. So, there it is. So, anyway, um, let's talk about how to put this on so that we can just, you know, Let's cleanse the pal a little bit and give you just a little bit of instruction on how to put this on the dog. So, I don't know this is going to necessarily fit because this is a stuffed animal and this was originally made for uh, an actual dog. But the first thing that you do is that you isolate the part that's actually the collar. You put that on them and then you adjust the collar to the appropriate size. So that's the first step. Don't even worry about the head halter part yet. All right. So that's the first step. So you get that part on. Now detach it. Now, this is how it's naturally going to fall. So you're going to have, this top part is the collar part. The hanging bit is the part that's supposed to go over their head. So you isolate that part. And then you grab it by the part that's going to go over their nose. Okay? 
So if you look at it, it's like a guy hanging upside down. There's the head, there's the two arms. That's the best way I can do to describe that. So now you have this part, put that over the nose, and then you cinch this part up underneath. Now, this is a hard part. You do want to get this as tight as you can. Like you do, it, I know it's going to feel like you're pinching their poor little underside, but you actually want to get it as tight as you can. This is very important. And then, of course, you have that clasp. You know, get it nice, you know, clasp it. Don't just let it loose, clasp it. So once that's fitted, that, that is fitted for life, just like the collar. So now, as long as the collar part is, is off, you can take that off and put it on, no problem. The reason why you want to have it as tight as possible is that if you do have it on the dog's nose and they are able to get it off, they just learned a lesson that unfortunately is going to be very hard to have them forget. They just learned that if they try hard enough to paw at it and they get it off, then they realize, I can get it off. And they're going to try for a lot longer than they would if you got it right the first time and then any time they stopped to try and paw at it, you deterred them from pawing at it and you just kept on moving. And you know, so eventually they're going to get to the point where they accept the fact that this is going to be their new reality when you have it on. And if it's anything like my dog, Lilu, so she's going to go for the walk. You're going to put this on her. She's going to be a lot better when she sees other dogs approaching from the other way. She's not going to jump at the end of the leash and like, you know, basically try and hurt your back by getting you, you know, to like, oh, I'm just going to get you a couple inches closer because I see another dog that I desperately want to say hi to. Instead, when they have this, when she has this on, I usually can get her back to my side with some treats and she realizes, no, 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 we're in head halter mode, much like a dog with a dog training vest mode would be like. And so it's still hilarious. All right, I'm not going to lie. When it comes time to come home and I take the collar part off and I take the head halter off, the first couple minutes that she's home, she's like, oh my God, she'll lay on the floor and she'll be like, oh my God, that was the worst thing ever. Oh, oh, the feelings of that, of that head halter on my face. She's a drama queen. Like, let's be honest. Would you rather have a choke collar or a prong collar or a, or, or, or a zap collar on them than just a simple piece of fabric over their nose? But I just think it's hilarious, like, you know, just how dramatic she is about that. And... What I want to close this off with is that I know that I've done this in another video, but you might not have seen the other video, but I like to leave a little Easter egg if you've been willing to sit through an entire podcast of me just talking about random bullcrap that you may or may not be interested in. And especially if you're suffering through the flickering of the background when I have a visual podcast and I hadn't fixed the background yet. So real quick, if you want to capitalize on the fact that they don't like something on the top of their nose, here's a cute little trick that I like to call, you should be ashamed of yourself. And what that is, is that you put a little bit of peanut butter on their nose, and they're like... And so they're going to take their paw to try and wipe it off, and as soon as they do, you go, yes, and you give them a treat. So they get the treat for it, and then eventually, if you, you, know, if you treat them and reward them enough times when they put their paw on their face, then what you can start doing is you can you know, slowly wean them off the peanut butter and just go, you know, you should be ashamed, and then they go, oh, that part, to the point where... For company, company needs to see the polished product, not the, you know, working up towards it. But the end result should be that, um, you know, if she's, like, being a little bit too, like, rambunctious, like, you know, company comes over and, you know, she might be, like, kangarooing a little bit. You know, like, oh, my God, there's company, there's company. And then it's just like, Lilu, you should be ashamed of yourself. And then she goes, oh. It's just stinking adorable. It's one of my favorite tricks. Um, again, I'm debating on... Uh, how far into the dog training aspect I want to get with these videos, but that's a little Easter egg for you for sticking around this long. You should be ashamed of yourself. It's a fun trick to try out, and it just goes with the dog's natural reaction. And you're training them by doing something that they absolutely love. You gave them peanut butter in their nose. I mean, come on. How, you know, how horrible of a training trick is that? So, again, thanks for listening. I know it's a lot to digest, but, you know, collars and leashes, I mean, that's your connection to the dog, so it is very important for you to get it right. And I feel like the more information you have the less you're going to be getting frustrated with, like, you know, I'm giving you 12 feet with the retractable. Why are you pulling even harder? Well, that's why. Now I gave you a little insight into the dog's side of things. So, you know, keep that in mind. And uh, I might revisit it, you know, later on. But for right now, I think that's more than enough to, uh, to you know, to digest. And I will see you 
next time I'm stalling to find the button.